All right. So our opening prayer today is a mix of two prayers. Uh, I'm going to read something from Syrac, which is one of the wisdom books, and then jump into a prayer from there. This is from Syrac chapter 48. In Isaiah's days, the sun went backward, and he prolonged the life of the king. By his dauntless spirit, he saw the future and comforted the mourners in Zion. He revealed what was to occur to the end of time and the hidden things before they happened. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, enlighten by your Holy Spirit those who learn and study the scriptures, that rejoicing in the knowledge of your truth, they may worship you and serve you from generation to generation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. So today is um, the first part of a much larger thing on Isaiah and we'll kind of go as we go through that. But my hope is that beginning today, I can give an overview of the book of Isaiah and kind of walk you through the, the big picture of it. And then starting next week, or maybe today, if we have a little bit of time, begin to actually read the book and uh, the other places Isaiah is mentioned. And I... I think it's important to read all of Isaiah, uh, whether we do it together or whether we do it on our own in a mix. There's so much that shows up that you'll be familiar with, and also a whole bunch of things that shows up that uh, is quoted in the New Testament that you might not be familiar with. The This is not an exhaustive list, but there's lists out there that try to figure out exactly how many times the book of Isaiah is quoted in the New Testament or referenced in the New Testament. And the one that I have is that there are 84 times that Isaiah is either quoted or pretty explicitly referenced in the New Testament. Uh, that breaks down to something like 25 times in the Gospels, and then uh, in the rest is in the various letters. That, though, 84 times actually is 61 references. And what I mean by that is sometimes uh, a given author will reference the exact same verse as another author in the New Testament. So let me quickly share my screen to show you what I'm talking about, because I think this will help. Can you see this red and black screen? Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. So these are, just to give you a sense, this is all the different times that Isaiah is quoted or referenced. So Isaiah 1, verse 9, is quoted in Romans uh, 9, 29. And if you sort of look down, you'll see that Romans passage has a whole bunch of other quotes from Isaiah as well. Uh, and Romans in general has a bunch. But just right here, there are four different... in in uh, chapter 9 of Romans, here's another one, that's five different Isaiah quotes all in one chapter. Uh, and here's another one over here. So sometimes they appear in bunches, but there's also times where, can anybody guess what this one um, is? Isaiah chapter 6, 9, and 10. The song for something? Um, hold on. Uh, and God said, go and say to his people, listen intently, but don't understand. Look carefully, but don't comprehend. So that's like the ear, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Make that. the minds, right. Make the minds of his people dull, make the his ears deaf and their eyes blind. How about this one? 714. It's in Matthew chapter one. 714. The birth narrative. Oh, the young woman is pregnant and is about to give birth to a son, and his name will be Emmanuel. So they're all over the place. Some are more obvious than others. And what we'll do as we go through the whole book is, as we come upon these, we'll talk, A, what the original context probably was, and B, how it has been interpreted in Christianity clearly how it was used and um, and if there are differences there or not and what and whether they matter and that sort of thing. Isaiah is sometimes referred to in the early church as the fifth gospel because it was so heavily used 
by the various New Testament writers. And uh, I can't remember who it was exactly, but it might have been um, Gregory of Nyssa or St. Jerome, who said that basically the entire book of Isaiah is clearly, you know, can be read. It doesn't have to be read like this, but clearly it can be read as a giant prophecy looking ahead to Jesus. And as we read through it, you'll see um, that that can be done in a variety of ways. It also is important to recognize that it's part of the Hebrew scriptures, and uh, for what it's worth, and it's worth quite a bit, certainly Jews would not interpret it that way now, uh, nor would they have back then. So um, we're going to try to look at it from uh, its original context and also in the, um, in the, uh, the New Testament context as well. So I have a PowerPoint presentation, which is not particularly long, but I think is probably useful to take a look at Isaiah. And, okay, let's see. Sorry, I don't, I don't use PowerPoint as much as I used to. So I need to figure out where it plays. One sec. Uh, slideshow, play. All right, now where did you all go? <laughs> I've lost you. All right, hold on. Uh, share screen, let's try this. We can see you. Yeah, yeah. How about this? Can you see my PowerPoint presentation? Yes, we can. All right. Now, can you still see the whole thing? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Does it say the book of Isaiah in John? Yes. Okay. All right. The book of Isaiah. Let's see if we can go forward. All right. So the background is pretty straightforward. The um, We're going to go over today basic background information on the book and the prophet. Um, the book itself is divided into three parts, which is chapters one through 39, and then 40 through 55, and 55 to 66. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. There are a number of people that would only divide it into two parts, which is one to 39, and then 40 to the end. And then there are also people, and this is actually very important, that continually remind us all to look at the book as a whole uh, because it may have been written at different points and we'll see that, but it is a single book and pr is presented as a single book and that's very important to remember. So who was Isaiah? Uh, we learn this in the first book, first verse of the book. Isaiah, uh, it starts off with the vision of Isaiah, son of Amoz, which he saw concerning Judah of Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So to give you a date, Uzziah reigned for a long time. And in chapter six of the book, when Isaiah tells about his vision of his call, it says in the year that King Uzziah died. So it's likely that Isaiah started prophesying or being active as a prophet sometime near the end of Uzziah's reign, which let's say 750-ish, right? Or something like that. Or 783. Oh, 738. Say that again? 738 BCE. Where are you getting that from? Get from this book, the Harper Collins Study Bible. Okay, well, they, so that's a good point is the little C here, which I just went away. Um, some of these dates are, they're not exact because they, they don't have, so 738 was when Uzziah dies, but it could have been 742. They're not, it's not like they kept time slightly differently. So these are vague give or take dates. So you're talking about somewhere in this realm that Isaiah was active. Sometime between 783 on the far end and sometime between 687. So if you do the math, that's a hundred year span and he probably didn't live or was active for 100 years. But these are those kings um, that he was active during. King Hezekiah plays a particular role in Isaiah. Why does I keep doing that? And you have to click on the page because it's not moving. It's not. No. Oh, that's great. Uh, okay. We're still on the first page. We're still on the first page. Right. All right, let me, uh, I don't like, this is why I don't like um, PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Yeah, I, 
That's okay. I will just share the actual PowerPoint thing and do it that way. All right. Can you see it now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is where I am. <laughs> is that better? Okay. So these are the years here. Um, and as Catherine noted, they're flexible, but give or take, this is what we're talking about. Okay. Um, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah. These are kings of Judah. If you remember from our Elijah and Elisha class, Elijah and Elisha were active in the north in Israel, and they were actually active quite a bit earlier than Isaiah. Uh, he's active a little late, and we'll, I'll show you a map of that in a second. Um, but this is when he's active, and most of what we have in terms of narrative is during the reign of King Hezekiah. All right, can you see this? Great. Okay. So these are the kings of Judah on the top. Judah is where Jerusalem is. Israel is in the north near the sea. And these are the kings of Israel. Um, I will do my best to make this a tiny bit bigger. And hopefully that will make your lives a little easier. Better? Okay. So if you remember, um, our earlier kings were, uh, sorry, Elijah and Elisha were active around, uh -huh. right? So this is right. Ahab right here, and that's around 874. Isaiah is way down here in Uzziah. So we're about 100 years later when we get to Isaiah, and Hezekiah is... Um, if you're comparing at least to Ahab, Hezekiah is pushing close to 150, 200 years later. So there's, there's a big time difference in terms of Elijah and Elisha and Isaiah. And we will see that this is the general timeline of what's going on. Um, the... Israelite monarchy begins with Saul, King David becomes king, Solomon builds a temple, the kingdom is divided. This is about where Elijah and Elisha are. And then the northern kingdom is conquered by Assyria and Isaiah is down here, right? This is somewhere around the time that prior to the exile to Babylon um, is where Isaiah is living and writing. But the book covers events that include all of this from not the temple being rebuilt, but it includes the exile itself and the return from exile. And if you begin to do the math, um, it becomes challenging to think about Isaiah living for 200 years and prophesying about events for 200 years. And so there's a couple of ways that you can think about this. One is the sort of classic traditional prophet seer <laughs> person and that the prophet is living in this time and prophesying about future events the challenge of that is that usually when you look at a prophet and you picture it like that um, it's visions and you have to interpret things in the case of Isaiah it's really 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 specific like people are named and events happen and so most scholars for a long, long time have looked at this and said, okay, the first 39 chapters of the book seem to be during Isaiah's lifetime. The next 40 through 55 seem to be during the Babylonian exile. And 55 through 66 seem to be after the exile. And we know, and you may remember this from the Elijah and Elisha class, we know that at least back then, and we also know this from Isaiah's book, that prophets did not function alone. Prophets, uh, prophets didn't function alone. They had, remember, do you remember what they were called with Elijah and Elisha, the sons of the prophets? Does that ring a bell? So like there's yeah. this whole group of followers that participate with them. And it seems likely that what happened was that Isaiah's prophetic school or group of disciples or what have you uh, continued into the exile, either kept his writings and added on to them and reinterpreted them, um, or kept his writings and published them 
and uh, added some details to them or uh, continued to prophesy in his name. It's totally impossible to determine exactly how that happened, but you have a book that spans um, well over like 150, 200 years. And some of the details are so specific in certain places. And it's already obvious when you're reading it that somebody has edited the thing together anyway. Um, so when you're thinking about it like this, it's a whole bunch of prophecies ordered into a much longer timeline. And the good thing about that is um, unlike most prophetic books of the Bible, Isaiah can actually be read as almost an entire cycle of history for the Jewish people because it starts with their, um, they have the kings and Hezekiah is a good king and then there's bad kings and this and that. And then the entire kingdom collapses and falls. They go into exile and then they come back and you get this whole long arc of sort of collapse, exile, and then hope at the end, which has been and can be reinterpreted into all sorts of other environments, um, modern stuff, New Testament stuff, uh, whatever you want. So let's see if I can. So back to who was Isaiah. I'm going to share my screen again, and hopefully the PowerPoint's still there. All right. Are we back to this? Okay. So we know that Isaiah is the son of Amos. Um, Isaiah has a wife, and she's called the prophetess. It's not clear uh, whether or not she herself was a prophet or whether the wife of the prophet was just called the prophetess. Um, you'll have to, that's open to interpretation. This is Isaiah had three or is it two? Um, two sons or three sons? And so he definitely has a son named Sheer Jashub and his, he uses, all of his children have names that are really explicit um, in terms of what they're mean, they mean. Uh, Sheer Jashub means a remnant shall return uh, his birth is talked about in Isaiah 7. There is, it's not as clear that Emmanuel is his son or not. Some scholars say, oh yes, Emmanuel is one of Isaiah's children, and it's he's using it as looking ahead to some other Messiah or messianic figure, um, possibly Hezekiah, who will be born later, or Josiah, who will be born even later. Um, but that's also in chapter 7. So this may or may not be one of Isaiah's children. Um, and then Maher Shalal Hashbaz. And if you follow acting, you actually may remember that there's, or may know there's an actor that's active today um, whose name is this. And um, that name means spoil quickly, plunder speedily. And so those are his kids. He also has disciples. We will learn about them in chapter eight. Uh, he shows up in other parts of the Bible. Uh, the book of Isaiah is giant, and the, the tail end, ending around chapter 39, um, but the sort of second section, uh, like the 20s and 30s of the book, deal with the same events that you can read about in a collapsed form in the book of the Kings, in 2 Kings 19 and 20, which we will read. And also in the book of Chronicles, you get a narrative of what goes on with Isaiah and Hezekiah. Uh, Isaiah also shows up, obviously in the book of Isaiah. His call is in chapter six. His last appearance in the book, and this lends some credence to the idea that perhaps his disciples continued to work on his material is in chapter 39. And again, the book is 66 chapters. So he doesn't make an appearance in chapters 40 through 66. It's just prophecies and that sort of thing. So about the book, it's written in Hebrew. Much of it, but not all of it, is poetry. Um, most scholars today believe that it was written over the course of over 200 years, beginning with Isaiah from sometime around 750 to 690. For the record, there is no doubt that Isaiah was a very longly active prophet. He lived for a while, and he, um, he was active as a prophet for a long time. So this is this 60-year span 
um, is a long time and it's also a reasonable length for what the book says and what scholars think. Uh, and that activity, that 200 year span continues with his disciples up to and through the Babylonian exile, which is 586 through 515. So you see the distance here? You've got a long time. <laughs> this is being, uh, you know, 200 plus years. Uh, and they continued to add prophetic material to the book and reinterpret the prophecies for their own time. So again, um, as we go through, most scholars today will divide the book into three parts. You don't have to do this, but it begins to make a little more sense as you do read through it, um, how it falls and breaks down. And they refer to proto or first Isaiah, which contain the words of the original Isaiah, um, generally material in one through 39, deutero Isaiah or second Isaiah, which seems to be the work of an anonymous author during the Babylonian exile. And that's generally the material in 40 through 55. And then Trito or third Isaiah, which is an anthology of 12 passages. And that's generally the material in 56 to 66. Um, unfortunately, these are not clean cut things. Like there are some scholars that will discern material um, in Trito Isaiah or in Proto Isaiah and say, oh no, this is Deutero Isaiah. It's impossible to, to separate this out. At the end of the day, you have one big book and it's convenient to divide it into three parts or as I mentioned earlier, it's convenient sometimes to divide it into two parts. I don't know if you clicked on the image, that cartoon that I sent out. Um, I, let's see if I can dig that up and share that because this, this is actually quite useful. Um, there it is, okay. So let's see if I have any more notes on here. Uh, so we're gonna look at it as a single book because we're gonna read it as a single book. But as we go through, um, we will keep an eye at least on these breakdowns and how they make some sort of sense. So this was the cartoon I sent out, but I'm gonna share the full HD version of it because it's much more fun to look at. Uh, let's see. All right, can you see it? Can you see all no. of it? Okay. No, you can't no, all no. Of it. We, see, no. we see your um, Email. background. Mm. Your I think that's computer. your e your download. All right, yeah. moved around, let's try again. Uh, desktop, let's try that one. Can you see it now? Yes. 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 All right, so these guys are the, um, it's a group that does it's called the Bible Project, and see down here, created by the Bible Project. They, um, I actually have the book that they published, which is fantastic. They have somebody that is a, like an honest to God Bible scholar. They're more evangelical, but they're not like way, way, um, they're kind of mainline Protestant evangelical. And um, the... They have a guy that, at least one guy that's a legitimate Bible scholar, um, has a PhD, that sort of thing. And another guy that obviously is a cartoonist um, or multiple people that are cartoonists. And they do, um, for every single book of the Bible, they do a one page cartoon summary of the entire thing, which is kind of neat. I don't know how well you can see, but it's one through 12 right here. And then there's little cartoons of what happens in each um, section 13 through 27, and he, they divide the book into two parts. Can you see exile down the middle? Um, mm -hmm. So the cartoons are interesting. They actually have videos and we will watch the Isaiah videos because they're not long. There's an eight minute video for one through 39 where they create the cartoon and he talks about it. And then there's another eight minute video um, for 40 through 48 uh, through 66. And again, he talks about it and they give you a really good summary of the book. And I recommend the site, which is called Bible Project, because I've found it's helpful to sometimes go back to these cartoons just to see where certain things happen um, in a given book. And I've watched a number of their videos and I find them helpful. So uh, we may visit that from time to time, 
but uh, oh, cheat sheets. It's a little cheat sheet. Yeah, it's very. Um, you can buy these as posters. I'm not sure if you want to, but you can buy these as posters, and um, everything they do, they make freely available. So their goal is to try to have as many people become biblically literate uh, as possible, which is a nice goal. And unlike a lot of other church products that charge for subscriptions, the Episcopal Church tends to operate that way. Everything is on a subscription model, which means nobody ever learns anything because nobody pays for it. So um, this I do recommend, and we will uh, watch some of these videos as well. And I think that was my complete overview. So before we jump in, we do have some time to start reading, which I'd like to do. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments thus far? All right. So um, let's read a little bit. And we're actually going to start with, we're going to use the Common English Bible for this uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, let's see, two kings, what chapter was that? Um, the Common English Bible has a couple of things that are convenient. One, it's a translation we don't tend to use that much. Two, it's a newer translation and it's quite colloquial, which means we should all be eas pretty easily uh, able to understand it. Um, three, because it's a different translation than what we're used to, I think it will help us think a little bit more about these passages um, that we may have heard a hundred times or more. And four, um, their website is not littered with ads like the other one that we've been using. So I'm going to share my screen again. And um, can you see the Common English Bible? Yes. All right. So is it, um, how big or small is the text? Is it readable now? Yes. Okay. So this is 2 Kings 19. As I had mentioned quickly, um, Isaiah appears in 2 Kings 19 and uh, 20. And there is a, uh, a narrative here, which we will revisit again, but I don't want to bounce back and forth between these. Um, and since we last couple of classes, we're dealing with Elijah and Elisha. This is a bit of a continuation of that. And uh, I do have one, one other thing I forgot to show you. Let me pull this up. Where is it? Um, ah, okay. Hold on. Let me share one more thing. Sorry. This is, okay. Can you see this? Yes. All right. Uh, this is just a list of when the prophets existed and wh who was king. I think this is kind of helpful in what the year is. So um, Elijah was around 874, give or take, during Ahab. Elisha, Ahaziah, 853. They're pretty close to each other. Um, as you go through, you'll see some other prophets. Joel maybe was around this time. Um, Jonah is dealing with Nineveh around this time. 796. Amos and Hosea uh, are active around this time. They are generally considered to be the two earliest written prophetic books. Um, Isaiah is after that. And um, these are the leaders right here of the king, the Judah kingdom. These are the kings of um, the northern Israel kingdom. So Isaiah starts with Uzziah, and again, the years are all over the map, but he goes all the way down to, uh, uh, to Hezekiah. And what's notable here, see Hezekiah, you see how there's no number 20 <laughs> in this line? Um, the northern kingdom is destroyed by Assyria at this point. So this is actually a fairly important event that happens um, and when Isaiah is talking about the Assyrians are coming or the Assyrians have destroyed Israel, it's because they are either coming to destroy Israel or they have already destroyed Israel. And, um, and are they going to come and destroy Hezekiah is the next question, right? So um, you keep going down. There's a couple of other, Micah shows up. He's also active around Hezekiah. Um, 
And it's probably worth noting that why are these prophets so active around Hezekiah? Um, well, because the Northern Kingdom is destroyed. That was a very big deal. And so the prophets were involved in trying to reform things, make people repent, um, explain why this was going on. And then if you keep going, you've got Nahum, you've got Zephaniah and Jeremiah. Um, they're down near Josiah. This is around the time that the southern kingdom of Judah uh, begins to collapse. These guys, if you look at the years, um, they don't reign for very long. They're, they're the last couple are not really kings. They're basically vassal kings. Um, Josiah is sort of the last real king. And then you go down, and then this is where Ezekiel and Daniel and Obadiah and Haggai and Zechariah, well, why are they all active during this time? Uh, well, because this is when the exile is going on. So you've got prophets that are active at a time where there are not, there's no kingdoms in one way or the other. And the people, um, not all of them, but all of the leaders and all of the artisans and all of the wealthy people were taken away to Babylon where they could um, either be slaves or contribute to society in some way there. And nothing was going on in Judah or Jerusalem or Israel or anything. And so the prophets are prophesying um, during the exile. And then uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, they come, that's when they come back and they begin to rebuild the temple. Um, and you have Malachi as the last prophet. And to give you a sense, we are still 400 and something years away from Jesus. Mm. So what happens in between, um, you can read the Maccabees and things like that. But the, uh, if you're reading your history portions, um, you know, we're in 2 Kings. After 2 Kings, it kind of jumps to uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. So you sort of skip over the exile. And they, they are beginning to rebuild when they come back. And um, Alexander the Great is probably 100 years after this. I think he's around 300 BC. And he sweeps down and conquers everywhere, including this area. And you eventually have a setup that by the time you get to King Herod, um, they have been run as a vassal state since, you know, uh, Babylon, Persia, uh, Alexander the Great with the Greeks, uh, the Macedonians, then the Romans. And so that area has been run um, very differently as a vassal state for um, hundreds and hundreds of years. And it's not that there weren't prophets, but the last written prophet is Malachi, uh, which covers that whole time period. Okay, so I did want to share that, and let me go again to passage. So, all right, this is Second Kings, um, in the chapter nineteen, and uh, we're just going to jump in. You're right in the middle of the story of Hezekiah. If you want to learn more about Hezekiah. Uh, feel free to read backwards uh, in the second book of the Kings. I mentioned this um, last class. If you want an extracurricular activity that will actually help, uh, I challenge you to read 1 Kings and 2 Kings in their entirety. Um, you will get bogged down with all sorts of names and people that you never heard about before, but you will get at least an overall um sense of the the history as it's told in second kings if you want to cheat you can go to like wikipedia or something and just kind of um get a summary of second kings and uh or and first kings and you'll get the same info but you won't get to read it um this is the first time isaiah shows up in the second book of the kings he has been active since king uzziah which is four kings earlier but he hasn't shown up in the narrative at all and he's not been mentioned in any way, shape, or form. So let's uh, read this. Obviously, please don't read the numbers that show up all over the place. Those are the verses. Um, Charlotte, do you want to start and read the first two paragraphs? Okay. When King Hezekiah heard this, he ripped his clothes, covered himself with mourning clothes, and went to the Lord's temple. He sent Eliakim, the palace administrator. Shebna, the secretary, and the senior priest to the prophet Isaiah, uh, Amaz's son. They were all wearing mourning clothes. Sorry. They said to him, this is what Hezekiah says. 
Today is a day of distress. Sorry, punishment and humiliation. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, let's let's let somebody else jump in. Patrice or uh, Catherine or somebody. This is what Hezekiah says. Today is a day of distress, punishment, and humiliation. Humiliation. It's as if children are ready to be born, but there's no strength to see it through. Perhaps the Lord your God has heard all the words of the field commander who was sent by his master, a serious king, how he insulted the living God. Perhaps God will punish him for the words the Lord your God heard. Send up a prayer for those few people who still survive. When King Hezekiah's servants got to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, say this to your master. This is what the Lord says. Don't be afraid at the words you heard which the officers of a serious king have used to insult me. I'm about to put a spirit in him. So when he hears a rumor, he'll go back to his own country. Then I'll have him cut down by the sword in his own land. All right, uh, Patrice, keep going. You might as well finish the paragraph. The field commander heard that the Assyrian king had left Lachish. So he went back to the king and found him attacking Libna. Then the Assyrian king learned that Cush's king Tikaka. Come on, help me out there. Tikaka was on his way to fight against him. So he sent messages to Hezekiah again, saying, Say this to Judah's king, Hezekiah. Don't let the God you trust in persuade you by saying, Jerusalem won't be handed over to the Assyrian king. You yourself have heard what Assyrian kings do to other countries, wiping them out. Is it likely that you will be saved? Did the gods of the nations destroyed by my fathers, Gozan, Haran, Rezeph, or the people of Edom in Telassar save them? Where now is Hamas king, Arpad's king, or the kings of Lear, Sepharim, Hena, or Eba? Great. So, I mean, the context here is Assyria is coming down to crush and destroy Judah and Jerusalem. And Hezekiah goes and talks to Isaiah and basically says, what do I do? And uh, Isaiah says, don't be afraid at the words you heard, which the officers have used to insult me about the Lord. Um, I'm about to put a spirit in him. So when he hears a rumor, he'll go back to his own country. Um, then I'll have him cut down by the sword. So there's some grandstanding going on with this. We've already destroyed all these other countries. We're going to destroy you. Um, Catherine, can you read Hezekiah's prayer? which is th this right here. Hezekiah took the letters from the messengers and read them. Then he went to the temple and, and spread them out before the Lord. Hezekiah prayed to the Lord saying, Lord God of Israel, you sit in throw on the winged creatures. You alone are God over all the earth kingdoms. You made both heaven and earth. Or turn your ears this way and hear. Or open your eyes and see. Listen to uh, Sennacherib's words. Sennacherib. Sennacherib's words. Send them to insult the living God. It is true, Lord, that Assyrian kings have destroyed many nations and their lands. The Assyrians can burn the gods of those nations with fire because they are not real gods. They are only man-made creatures of wood and stone. That is how the Assyrians could destroy them. So now, Lord our God, please save us from the Sanabrim's power. And all the earth kingdom will know that you, Lord, are the only true God. Great. Okay. Um, so Hezekiah's prayer basically says, well, the Assyrians destroyed everybody else because they're worshiping idols. Lord, prove that uh, that you're a true God. Um, anybody want to? Charlotte, you're back. Do you want to? Uh, all right. Okay. Continue with this and read Isaiah's prophecy. Then Isaiah, uh, uh, from starting there, then yeah. Isaiah, Ammon's yeah. son, sent a message to Hezekiah. This is what the Lord Israel's God says, I have heard your prayer about Syria's king, Sennacherib. Sennacherib. This is, say Sennacherib. it again. Sennacherib. Sennac, 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 say it again. Sennacherib. 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 Yep. Sennacherib. This is a message that the Lord has spoken against him. 
The young woman, daughter Zion, despises you and mocks you. Daughter Jerusalem shakes her head behind your back. Whom did you insult and ridicule? Against whom did you raise your voice and pridefully lift your eyes? It was against the Holy One of Israel. You've insulted the Lord with your mess mess messengers, you said. I, with my many chariots, have gone up to the highest mountains, to the farthest riches of Lebanon. Reaches of Lebanon. I have cut down its tallest cedars, the best of its pine trees. I have reached its most remote lodging place, its best forest. I have dug wells, have drunk waters in foreign lands. With my own feet, I dried up all of Egypt's streams. Haven't you heard? I set this up long ago. I planned it in the distant past. Now I have made it happen and making fortified cities collapse into piles of rubble. Their citizens have lost their power. They are frightened and ashamed. They become like plants in a field, tender green shoots, the grass on rooftops burned up before it matures. I know where you live, how you go out and come in, and how you rage against me. And because you rage against me and because your pride has reached my ears, I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth. I will make you go back the same way you came. Great. Okay. So it's a, for what it's worth, the formatting of this sort of thing, mm -hmm. pretty much every Bible follows this pattern where the formatting, this is narrative. And when they lay it out like this, this is poetry. And so Isaiah tends to prophesy, as do all of the prophets, in poetic um, Hebrew verse. It's mm -hmm. Hebrew poetry is different from English poetry. It doesn't rhyme and that sort of thing. It's, it's a different type of thing. It right. has a lot of duplicated things where you'll get one image and then you'll get a similar image and then you'll get one image and then you'll get a similar image. Uh, in this piece of poetry, this prophecy, he says, you've done all this stuff. You've gone down all these different places uh, and all of this but this was all part of my plan. And what's gonna happen next is that everybody uh, is, you, you're now raging against me, but my plan is that I will make you go back home. So the prophecy basically says that everything that Assyria has been doing up to now, destroying all these other places is at least in some part, if not completely, part of God's plan to show that the Lord is the most powerful and that these other gods are not powerful by sending back Sennacherib to Assyria. And so how is this going to happen? We will read the next portion. Um, Barbara, do you wanna read the next little bit? <clears throat> now, with, now this will be the sign for you, Hezekiah. This year you will eat what grows by itself. Next year you will eat what grows from that. But in the third year, sow seed and harvest it. Plant vineyards and eat their fruit. The survivors of the house of Judah who have escaped will take root below and bear fruit above. Those who remain will go out from Jerusalem and those who survive will go out from Mount Zion. The zeal of the Lord of heavenly forces will do this. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about Assyria's king. He won't enter this city. He won't shoot a single arrow there. He won't come near the city with a shield. He won't build a ramp to besiege it. He will go back by the same way he came. He won't enter this city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. That night, the Lord's messenger went out and struck down 185,000 soldiers in the Assyrian camp. When people got up the next morning, there were dead bodies everywhere. So Assyria's king, Sennacherib, departed, returning to Nineveh, where he stayed. Later, while he was worshiping in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons Andromelech and Sharechzer killed him with a sword. They then escaped to the land of Ararat. His son Ezrahaddon succeeded in the king. All right, so what's gonna happen? And notice this changes gears from poetry into narrative. Uh, but what's gonna happen is that don't worry about it. You can plant your seeds and you can do what you want. Uh, a serious king's not going to come, not going to besiege a city, nothing like that. And then this looks suspiciously like a plague. 
hits the army and they're wiped out. And so he goes back, King Sennacherib goes back and he's assassinated by his sons and killed. Interestingly, while he's worshiping in the temple of his God. So his God is not only not able to defeat Jerusalem, his God also is not even able to protect him while he's in the temple worship. So that's this. Then there's one other chapter where Isaiah shows up in Kings. All right. Let's keep going. Um, who has not read? Etta, have you read? Missy, have you read? I don't know. No, I haven't. So read um, basically what you can see. Okay. Around that same time, Hezekiah became deathly ill. The prophet Isaiah, Amos' son, came to him and said, this is what the Lord says. Put your affairs in order because you're about to die. You won't survive this. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord saying, please, Lord, remember how I have walked before you in truth and sincerity. I have done what is right in your eyes. Then Hezekiah cried and cried. Isaiah hadn't even left the middle courtyard of the palace when the Lord came to him. Turn around, say to Hezekiah, my people's leader, this is what the Lord, the God of your ancestor David says. I have heard your prayer and have seen your tears. So now I'm going to heal you. Three days from now, you will be able to go up to the Lord's temple. I will add 15 years to your life. I will rescue you and this city from the power of the Assyrian king. I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant, David. Then Isaiah said, prepare a bandage of, made of figs. They did so and put it on the swelling, at which point Hezekiah started getting better. Hezekiah said to Isaiah, what is the sign that the Lord will heal me, that I'll be able to go up to the Lord's temple in three days? Isaiah said, this will be your sign from the Lord, that he will make his promise to come true, should the shadow go forward 10 steps or back 10 steps. It's easy for the shadow to go forward 10 steps, Hezekiah said, but not for the shadow to go back 10 steps. So the prophet Isaiah called on the Lord who made the shadow go back 10 steps down the flight of stairs built by Ahaz. Great. Okay. So for we talked we talked about this in a different context yesterday, but the what's going on here is that the sun, he's sending the sun backwards. And if you think of a uh, what are those things called? The, sundial. The sundial. If you think of a sundial, it's they're they're looking at the stairs as if it was, you know, not a sundial, but it which is easier to send the sun a little faster forward or to go backwards. And so he sends the sun backwards, which um, is arguably the most impressive miracle in the Bible, if for what it's Your worth. Your voice is uh, crazy. We're losing you. We're losing you. Uh, Hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Your voice is uh, cracking. It's cracking? Am I back? Yes, you're back. Okay. It says my internet connection is unstable because um, I have a perfect connection. <laughs> 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 and uh, the, the company that uh, we use obviously is not as reliable. Um, anyway, I'm not sure if you heard what I said or not, but the, the miracle that he does is... He sends the sun backwards and they measure it on the steps, the stairway down for Ahaz's stairway. And someone does not want us to hear the end of this about the no. sun going backwards. Every time you start to mention it, your voice goes away. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I guess we're not supposed to know, huh? That's the secret. <laughs> it's a secret. That's the most interesting it's a secret. part. It's a secret. <laughs> yeah that's the, the most stuff. interesting part the, yeah that's amazing isaiah's miracle is that the sun goes backwards down the stairs i mean it, the sun normally goes whichever way mm -hmm. and he turns the sun around and it goes backwards enough <laughs> look at this it goes <laughs> that's amazing yeah. it is oh, amazing, amazing. Well, well, matt you're frozen okay. no matt. miracle left today you froze yeah. No miracle good. today. Oh. <laughs> Am I still frozen? No. Not no. Not only when we talk, talk about the sun. It's only, only when, when I talk about, about the sun, sun going backwards. Yes. Talk about backwards. Then you freeze. I love it. 
<laughs> I love it. It's a well, sign. Well, let's talk about something else then. Um, <laughs> it's a sign, okay? It's a sign. Um, all right. Well, let's keep going then, since I'm not allowed to talk about the sun going backwards. <laughs> After the sun goes backwards, down the 10 steps, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> they use, all I've been trying to say is they use the flight of stairs as a sundial. Okay. That's all. And all right. It's a very <laughs> big miracle to turn the sun backwards, oh, yeah. uh, to, to make time go backwards. Let's keep reading in the hopes that you can, I'm not going to read because I can't be heard. Missy, you're here. Can you read? You're muted if you want. Sure. Um, at that time, Merodach Baladan, son of Babylon's king, Baladan, sent messengers to Hezekiah with letters and, and a gift. This was because he had heard that Hezekiah was sick. Hezekiah granted them an audience and showed them everything in his treasury the silver, the gold, the spices, and the fine oil. He also showed them his stock of weaponry and everything in his storehouses. There wasn't a single thing in his palace or his whole kingdom that Hezekiah didn't show them. Then the prophet Isaiah came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say? Where have they come from? Hezekiah said, They came from a distant, distant country, Babylon. What have they seen in your palace? Isaiah asked. They have seen everything in my palace, Hezekiah answered. There's not a single thing in my storehouses that I haven't shown them. Then, has, then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, listen to the Lord's word. The days are nearly here when everything in your palace and all that your ancestors collected up to now will be carried off to Babylon. Not a single thing will be left, says the Lord. Some of your children, your very own offspring, will be taken away. They will become eunuchs in the palace of Babylon's king. Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The Lord's word that you've spoken is good because he thought there will be peace and security in my lifetime. The rest of Hezekiah's deeds and all his powerful acts, how he made the pool and the channel and brought water inside the city, Aren't they written in the official records of Judah's kings? Hezekiah lay down with his ancestors. His son Manasseh succeeded him as king. Okay, great. Okay, great. So three things, and hopefully you can hear me on this. One, in the second book of the Kings, Isaiah basically does three things. He deals with the Assyrian army and makes a prophecy that there's going to that they're going to go away. They have a plague, they all die, they go away. Soon after Hezekiah gets sick, and I'm not allowed to talk about this, but the <laughs> sign of his healing in 3 days and that he'll go back into the temple and be able to worship is that the sun goes backwards. And the third thing is Hezekiah, and we'll read, some of these things resurface in the book of Isaiah, but Hezekiah gets some visitors from a foreign country, and he makes the uh, kind of dopey move of showing them every single treasure that, <laughs> that he has, <laughs> and Isaiah says, well, where were they from? Babylon. Oh, that's some distant country, Babylon. Uh, what's the problem? And Isaiah says, well, the problem is that the Babylonians are going to absolutely ransack and wipe out um, your country, but it's going to happen because you've already gotten 15 extra years because of this sign with the sun going backwards. It's actually going to happen after you die. And Hezekiah, this uh, Hezekiah is great. Oh, Seems good to me. I'll be dead. That's his <laughs> response. And, um, and, uh, and, you know, now for what it's worth, his son Manasseh succeeds him. Hezekiah is one of the best kings, and Manasseh is arguably the worst. And so maybe Hezekiah was like, 
they're going to they're going to get their dessert anyway because they're not good people. So, but that's the end of Hezekiah and that last little bit. You'll see this again and again in both the first book of the Kings and second book of the Kings and also in the Chronicles. It mentions, you know, so and so died and the rest of his deeds aren't they written in the official records of the kings of Judah or the official records of the kings of Israel? And it would be great if we had those books, but we don't. But it's an interesting reference point that comes up again and again that there seem to be detailed records that whoever was working on these two biblical books, Chronicles and Kings, had access to and they've been lost. So that's the last little thing before we check out is we're going to look quickly at Second Chronicles because Isaiah shows up there. It's a much shorter passage to Chronicles, I think it's 32, uh, to Chronicles 32. Okay, so I'll share my screen again and hopefully we can see this and then we will wind down for today. So this is Second Chronicles. Um, and, uh, I don't know, uh, who wants to read, uh, uh, Patrice, do you want to read? Sure. Can you move it down a little bit? I have some, something in the way that I can't, there you go. Thank you. After these things and these faithful acts, a serious King Sennacherib invaded Judah and attacked its fortified cities, intending to capture them. When Hezekiah realized that Sennacherib also planned on fighting Jerusalem, he consulted with his officials and soldiers about stopping up the springs outside the city, and they supported him. A large force gathered to stop up all the springs and the streams that flowed through the land. Why should the kings of Assyria come and find plenty of water, they asked. Hezekiah vigorously rebuilt all the broken sections of the wall, erected towers, constructed another wall outside the first, reinforced the terrace of David's city, and made a large supply of weapons and shields. He appointed a mil military officers over the troops, assembled them in the square of the city gate, and spoke these words of encouragement. Be brave and be strong. Don't let the king of Assyria and all those warriors he brings with him scare you or cause you dismay, because our forces are greater than his. All he has is human strength, but we have the Lord our God, who will help us fight our battles. The troops trusted King Judah's king Hezekiah. After this, a serious king, Sennacherib, who was attacking Lachish with all his forces, sent his servants to Jerusalem with the following message for Judah's king Hezekiah and all the people of Judah who were in Jerusalem. This is what the serious king Sennacherib said. What makes you so confident that you stay put in Jerusalem while it is being attacked? Obviously, Hezekiah has fooled you into surrendering yourselves to death by hunger and thirst when he says, the Lord our God will rescue us from the Assyria's king. Isn't this the same Hezekiah who got rid of his shrines and altars and then demanded of Judea, Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship and burn incense before only one altar. Don't you know what I and my predecessors have done to the people of other nations? Where any of the, were any of the gods of these other nations able to rescue their lands from my power? Which one of any of the gods of these nations that my predecessors destroyed was able to rescue them from my power? So why should your God be able to rescue you from my power? Don't let Hezekiah seduce you like fools. Don't believe him. No God of any other nation or kingdom has been able to rescue their people from me or from my predecessors. No, your gods won't rescue you from my power. The Assyrians king's servants continue to make fun of the Lord God and his servant Hezekiah. He wrote other letters insulting the Lord God of Israel, defying him by saying, just as the gods of the nations in other countries couldn't rescue their people from my power, Hezekiah's God won't be able to rescue his people from my power. Then they shouted loudly in Hebrew at the people of Jerusalem gathered at the wall in an attempt to frighten and demoralize them in order to capture the city. They spoke about the God of Jerusalem as though he were the work of human hands, like the gods of the other peoples of the earth. King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, Amos' son, prayed about this, crying out to the heaven. 
Then the Lord sent a messenger who destroyed every warrior, leader, and officer in the camp of the Assyrian king. When Sennacherib went home in disgrace, he entered the temple of his God and his own sons killed him with a sword. This is how the Lord rescued Hezekiah and the citizens of Jerusalem from the power of Assyria's king Sennacherib and all others, giving them rest on all sides. Many people brought offerings to the Lord in Jerusalem and costly gifts to Judah's king Hezekiah, who was highly regarded by all the nations from then on. Great. Okay. Uh, and uh, Missy, can you finish us off with the end of this from Hezekiah's illness? You got to unmute though. Got to unmute. Unmute. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Around that same time, Hezekiah became deathly ill and prayed to the Lord, who answered him with a miraculous sign. But Hezekiah was too proud to respond appropriately to the kindness he had received. And he, along with Judah and Jerusalem, experienced anger. However, Hezekiah and the citizens of Jerusalem humbled themselves in their pride, and so they didn't experience the, experience the Lord's anger for the rest of Hezekiah's reign. Hezekiah became very wealthy and greatly respected. He made storehouses for his silver, gold, precious stones, spices, shields, and other valuables. He made barns to store the harvest of grain, wine, and olive oil, stalls for all kinds of cattle, and pens for flocks. He acquired towns for himself and many flocks and herds because God had given him great wealth. Hezekiah was the one who blocked the upper outlet of the waves of the Gihon Spring, channeling them down to the wide side of David's city. Hezekiah succeeded in all that he did, even in the matter of the ambassadors sent from Babylonian officials to find out about the miraculous sign that occurred in the land when God had abandoned him in order to test him and discover what was in his heart. The rest of Hezekiah's deeds, including his faithfulness, are written in the vision of the prophet Isaiah, Amos' son, in the records of Israel's and Judah's kings. Hezekiah lay down with his ancestors and was buried in the upper area of the tombs of David's sons. All Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem honored him at his death. His son Manasseh succeeded him as king. Okay, great. So we're going to wind down. But that gives you some of the background and the other references for Isaiah in the Bible. It's worth noting that archaeology still plays a pretty heavy role in some of these things. I think it was in 2015 that they found, they think they found Hezekiah's tomb. And uh, like two or three years later, in the 10 feet away from that, they found a... Uh, an amulet that said something like here is buried Isaiah the prophet and uh, it would be interesting it's it, it's impossible to know if it, because there's fragments of things but it um, there seems to be at least archaeological proof that that um, these guys were around the same time and uh, maybe they'll find more because archaeological proof is usually hard to do more than just say Seems more likely, <laughs> but there we go. So that's it. Next time we will actually start reading the book of Isaiah and um, we'll begin to move through it. But sorry for the slightly extended session today. And uh, anything before we go? Nothing. All right, great. Good to see you all. See you next Thursday. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.